I think we are about ready to start this last part of session three. The last part of the session consists of two presentations made by two master students from Hamburg University who have done their experimental work also in St. Andrews, Canada. I will give the word to Fleming. I think you are just about to finish your master as well as your... Um, I, I just handed it in. <laughs> just handing it. it's, it's, it's not my master, it's my diploma. It's even better. That is for the PhD or...? No, no, no. Diploma is, is the old master version. Okay. Good. Almost the same. I give the word to you in any case. Fleming Dalge will talk about variability and development during early life phases of Western Atlantic cod and Baltic cod in relation to paternity and water temperature. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you for our introduction. Um, I did two separate experiments together with my friend Sebastian Politis, each at the St. Andrews Biological Station and the Bornholm Hatchery. And we divided our study into an embryonic part, which I will present right now, and a larval part, which will be presented by Sebastian right afterwards. To get you into the topic of paternity and temperature, I will start with some simple facts about the complex spawning behavior of cod, which involves courtship by males, female mate choice, and promiscuous fertilization, which means that the eggs of one female can be fertilized by several males more or less at the same time. It has been hypothesized that this behavior may be an adaptation to variable mate compatibility. And interestingly, this strategy has also been observed in other species. But uh, <laughs> since we are on the fish conference, I will continue with cod, uh, which inhabits shelf areas all across the North Atlantic from temperatures between zero degrees and up to 20 degrees in the most southern areas. We use for our experiments fish from the Gulf of Maine and the Eastern Baltic stock, which normally spawn from four to six and three to seven degrees, whereas worst case climate change scenarios predict water temperature to increase by three to four degrees during the next 100 years in both regions. This increase in temperature could be harmful for the recruitment of both populations, since the thermal limits for embryonic stages is much lower than for older stages indicated by the correlation of temperature and mortality on the right side of the slide. In a comparative study of nine different cod stocks residing at different bottom temperatures, the authors demonstrated that an increase in SST would lead to an increase in recruitment of the stocks at the colder temperatures and to a decrease in recruitment of the stocks that reside at warmer regions. The ecological question behind this scenario would be whether there is any potential for adaptation to changing climate conditions. We propose that paternal effects have to be investigated in order to answer this question. During the last 60 years, there has been a huge amount of studies that focused on the effects of incubation temperature. <clears throat> and uh, only a small number of these studies used a controlled mating design in order to relate the effect of temperature to individual parentage. Most of these studies were able to demonstrate that parentage has a significant effect on the influence of temperature, whereas only one study was able to demonstrate explicit paternal effects. Surprisingly, a small number of studies focused on guided species, whereas none of these studies used multiple temperature treatments. We assume that Paternal effects have rarely been demonstrated because they were superimposed by the non-genetic maternal contribution. So with this very simplified schematic, I want to demonstrate the effects of different air quality aspects like egg size and egg composition that have a strong effect on the reproductive output. So in order to evaluate the paternal effect accurately, we kept the maternal contribution constant by fertilizing the eggs of one female with several males and incubating the embryos at different temperatures in order to investigate the effects of paternity and temperature 
on the reproductive success, embryonic development, and embryonic survival of two distinct cod populations. For our artificial fertilization, we used wild caught captive broodstock that was maintained at ambient temperature in St. Andrews, Canada, and at constant temperatures on Bornholm. We randomly selected the parents from the tanks and hand stripped them. Shortly after stripping, we divided the eggs of one female into several equal portions according to the number of males we used. And then we fertilized the eggs by applying the dry fertilization method. This is me fertilizing the little Ernie's at the Bonhomme facility. Um, the floating eggs were then distributed into our um, static 250 milliliter glass incubation beakers, whereas each male was represented by four replicates in each temperature treatment. Water exchange was done regularly and dead eggs were removed every day. For the Atlantic cod experiment, we used a temperature range from two to 10 degrees, whereas for the Baltic cod experiment, we used a temperature range from 6.5 to 12.5 degrees. This is an example of a handmade temperature controlled water bath incubation unit, which we used for the Bonhomme experiment. So fertilization success was calculated as the percentage of viable eggs that were fertilized by each male. And as you can see, fertilization success of the Atlantic cod crossings was high, with no significant differences among males, whereas the fertilization success of the Baltic cod crossings was much lower, but the differences among males were highly significant. The fertilized eggs that were incubated in the different temperature treatments followed a common pattern of cumulative survival over time, which could be characterized by three different periods. Approximately 90% of the total mortality occurred during the first period, which lasted until the end of gastrulation or stage two after the sheem after Thompson and Riley. Almost no losses occurred during the second period until the transition of stage three to four, and afterwards, mortality tend to increase again just prior to hatch and during hatching, hatching, which started at stage four. The next slide will give you an overview of what happened between fertilization and the event of hatching. So first, I want you to notice that each dot of these plots, plots represents the mean value of the different males, and the arrow bars represent the differences among males calculated as standard deviation. So on the y-axis you see survival, and on the x-axis you have time post-fertilization and days. So the main message on this slide is that survival together with differences among males decreased with, with increasing temperature in both experiments. But more interesting is that the differences among males occurred during the period of gastrulation, which can be termed as critical in terms of mate compatibility. And uh, the delay of the beginning of this period at the colder temperature indicating, is indicating already the anticipated influence of temperature on the rate of development, which becomes more obvious if we plot time to 50% hatch versus temperature, displaying an exponential decrease in time to hatch with increasing temperature for both populations. Since there were no differences in the rate of development among the different males, and Sebastian will in go into this in more detail, I will move forward and have a closer look on the effects of temperature and paternity on survival, which was summarized by the measure of hatching success. Hatching success was calculated as the percent of larvae that hatched from fertilized eggs, whereas each male is represented here by the different lines with different symbols, whereas the arrow bars represent the standard deviation of the four replicates in each temperature. So survival over temperature for the Atlantic experiment followed a dome-shaped pattern with a 
steep decrease in survival at 10 degrees, whereas survival for Baltic cod embryos decreased in a linear fashion from 6.5 to 12.5 degrees. The applied two-way ANOVA analysis revealed that the interaction of temperature and paternity was highly significant. Consequently, we used separate one-way ANOVAs to reveal differences among temperatures and among the different males. If males were combined, there were no differences among temperatures from 2 to 8 degrees for Atlantic and from 6.5 degrees for Baltic cod. But if the different males were analyzed separately, we revealed that, for example, the offspring sired by Cassius experienced also significantly reduced survival at 8 degrees, and the offspring sired by Bob experienced also significantly survival at 2 degrees. Similar results were observed for Baltic cod. So we want to state at this point that disregarding paternal effects in the assessment of temperature effects would lead to a false interpretation of the observed variability. And further, we suggest that there is a mechanism for adaptation to changing climate conditions via the paternal contribution. So paternal effects were highly significant in both experiments, with uh, one male being superior over other males in both experiments. The fact that with the optimal mate combination compared to the worst mate combination led to an increase in survival of up to 30% in both experiments demonstrates the importance of paternity for the reproductive potential of both populations. So to conclude, paternity has to be considered in the assessment of temperature effects on embryonic life stages. Our results suggest a potential mechanism for adaptation to changes in temperature conditions and paternity can substantially influence the survival of a female's offspring. Since we demonstrated this in two different distinct populations by investigating only nine half-sibling families, we are quite confident about our results. So for the future, it would be meaningful to maintain broodstocks at different temperatures to investigate the impact of thermal experience and also to apply biochemical or genetic techniques and also physiological measurements to gain a more thorough understanding of the underlying mechanisms. Of particular interest, it would be to conduct repeated experiments with the same parents throughout the spawning season to investigate or even prove the genetic incompatibility hypothesis. So at the end, I want to thank Fresh Cost for funding because otherwise all these experiments uh, would not have been done. And then I want to thank you all. <laughs>